How do you do? We are at Bible study lesson number two. Remember, uh, just a little quick recap. The whole Bible is about Jesus, and we started with the very first lesson showing that Jesus didn't, he didn't just show up in Bethlehem as a babe in a manger. He's always been. He's the creator. All things were made by him for him. And now, and, uh, I think it's important before we move on any further to, to ask the question, why? Why did Jesus have to come and die in the first place and rise again? It's because of a little three-letter word called sin. And that's, a, that's a big deal in the Bible. It's a big deal in our lives. And we be well do to figure this thing out. What is sin? Uh, easiest definition, it, it's an offense. It's a transgression. A lot of them say it's to sin is to miss the mark. You know, you, if you can picture somebody shooting a bow and arrow and you just completely miss, that's what they say sin is. But I like to go and see what the Bible actually says about it. And it says a lot. And many different ways you can sin. Let's go over some of that, what we do that's sin. In, uh, in Romans chapter 14, uh, the context of that verse, I'll give you a little background Paul's talking about uh, eating certain meats that have been offered to idols. See, he's writing to the church at Rome, and Rome was just like the hub, one of the hubs of idolatry. They have so much idolatry in that whole region. And Rome, the people that Paul writes to, Rome and Corinth, Ephesus, all those places. Remember, greatest Diana of the Ephesians and all this different stuff. They worshipped all kinds of pagan stuff, and they would take this meat and offer it to their gods. But then, they, you know, being that their gods aren't real, they, they couldn't burn in to receive it. So they then would take the meat and sell it in the marketplace for people to eat. And uh, what Paul's bringing up here is that, you know, you have certain people that are newborn, newborn babes in Christ who are still weak in the faith versus people that are mature in the faith. Now, a mature Christian knows that there is no God but one God, and that meat got offered to nothing. So it's all right if you receive it with thanksgiving. You can eat that meat and not be condemned in your conscience. But what he's saying is somebody that's weak in the faith that knows that that meat was offered to an idol and they see you eating it, it's going to condemn them in their conscience. Because they may say, well, if he's eating it, I can eat it. But if it's in their, in their conscience not to eat it, then they've sinned. And if you do it in front of them, then you've sinned against them. And by proxy, you've sinned against the Lord Jesus Christ. So he tells you not to do that. But the the capper to that verse is whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So just think about that, you know. Meditate on that. And the things you do throughout your day, something that you do that is not of faith of God, it's sin. And we don't stop there. It keeps it going. You go to James chapter 2. He's talking about uh, the context of this one is when somebody comes in, he, he, he gives a contrast of two different types of people that come into your church. One of them's dressed to the nines. He's got his flashy gold chains on. You know he's got money. And another guy comes in behind him that's just got rags on. You can tell he don't even look like he's eating them a week. Poor. And he says, if you show partiality to the rich guy just because he's rich, you've committed sin. He says, don't say to that guy that comes in with the, the fine clothes on, sit here, sit here in the uppermost room or the, the best spot, and then turn around and say to that poor man, you know, you go over there and stand, or you sit here at my footstool. He said, you've committed sin. That's what having respect of persons is, is showing partiality or favoritism. And he goes on to make the point, these people, these rich people that you're showing so much favor to, they don't care nothing about you. They they. They'll walk all over you the first chance they get. Why do you even think about them? But uh, he says, if you show that respect to persons, you've committed sin. There's another way. Staying in James in chapter 4, here's a big one you hear all the time. It says, to know to do good and do it not. That is sin. To him it's sin. You know, all kinds of things that we do that we shouldn't do is certainly sin. We'll get to that. That's transgression of the law. But things that we know to do that's good that we don't do, to him it's sin. You know, and if the Lord puts something on your heart and you know it deep inside, you should you should go do this and you don't do it according to the word. That's sin. And there's a reason for all these. First John three, four, it says that sin, I just mentioned this and is a transgression of the law, God's law. I remember the Ten Commandments and then there was several more. 
you transgress those laws, you've committed sin. 1 John 5, 17, and here's one that gets us all. It says, all unrighteousness is sin. So the point of all this is to show that you really can't go throughout your day without doing some of this. You know, as a worldly person, somebody that's not been born again, that's not got the truth inside of them, that incorruptible seed, you have no chance of making it through. The, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you're going to do something that's not of faith. You're going to commit some unrighteous act. You might think not, but it says your righteousness. That's why we have to have the righteousness of Jesus. That was part of what went on on that cross. He was made to be sin so that we could be made his righteousness because our righteousness, according to the word, is just filthy rags. So there are several examples of sin, and that's why we need Jesus. That's why he had to die. It's why he had to be our substitute, our propitiation for sin, as it were. And, uh, you know, where did sin come from? You go back and you go through the creation of the world, I ain't going to get into a lot of deep stuff in that because there's a lot of other things to talk about. But if you just go strictly by what, you know, day one, let there be light, all this stuff, he always looked and God seen that it was good. And when he created man, he seen that it was all very good. So what happened? He he took the man and stuck him in the garden and he told him to tend it, to uh, to guard it, to keep it, which means guard it. Why would he have to guard it? Because there was a being already there that uh, was sinful from the start. It says he was a murderer from the beginning and a liar. And he came in the form of a serpent. He says the serpent was more subtle than every beast of the field. That's why Adam was told to keep it. And uh, that's why the responsibility of the sin entering into the world is placed on Adam, even though that serpent had already sinned. And if we find out, you read through, I think it's First Timothy somewhere, it talks about... Uh, that Eve was actually the one in she was the one that was deceived. She was in transgression. You go back and read that story. She was the first one that ate, wasn't she? But it's always ascribed to Adam. Why? Because he was the one that was given dominion over all these things. He was the one put in charge. He was the head of the he was the big chief, the head of the house. And if you go back and read Romans, I think it's chapter five, it says, For by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So you're starting to get a picture of why it, it took Jesus to come and die but before you ever get jesus you know before let me say this before i go on any further you know these sins uh how they come in let's go over what it caused first let's go over you know that sin that first sin in the garden let's see what it actually caused from that first of all the curse you go read genesis 3 14 through 24 i won't read it you go read it but part of that curse was the serpent you remember when he god confronts them he says, Adam, what have you done? You know, he says, well, that woman that you gave me, she gave to me and I ate. And he's like, what have you done? And she looks over at the serpent and says, well, he beguiled me. And then he looks at the servant or the serpent, rather. He says, you're going to be cursed above all these things at the field. You're going to crawl on your belly. You're going to eat dust. That's the curse to the servant. What I keep calling servant, serpent. Then he looks at the woman and he says, here's your curse. You're going to be, when you give birth, it's going to hurt. That's why it's called labor pains to this day. That's where that started. That's where that come. You know, if that hadn't come, probably wouldn't have been no problem. But now women have to go through these. If you've ever been there, I've been there twice watching it ringside and it's tough. And uh, Adam, you know, he gets the joy of being the, the cause for all this, the main thing. But he also, he's going to be cursed. He cursed the ground and Adam's, you know, that was his goal was to tend the ground and keep it and raise crops. Now he's going to have to do it with thorns and thistles and he's going to have to do it by the sweat of his brow. That's part of his curse. And uh, a big part, they got expelled from the garden. You know, uh, the tree of life, which they could have ate and ate and lived forever, that got barred away. Couldn't get there. Separated from God. No longer walked with them in the cool of the day. And even though he still, he came down and talked with people throughout the Bible, Abraham and Jacob and all of them, but... Uh, that relationship was breached, wasn't it? And uh, it'll cause you, in a, you know, in our own lives, looking at it this way, Paul puts it this way in Romans 7, that, you know, we mentioned that dying spiritually, that kind of happened to them. Here's, here's what that means. Paul says, speaking of the law, he said, I was alive without the law. And he's talking about when he was a young child. 
But when the law came, the commandment came, he says, sin revived because where the law is, that's when sin moves in because it's weak. The law is weak in the flesh and it takes advantage. Sin takes occasion against your flesh through the law because if you didn't know the law, then there was no, it says right in there, before the law, there was no transgression. But he says, I was alive without the law when that commandment came, sin revived and I died. That that beautiful, spotless spirit that's in these little children. You reach that age, you know, the age of accountability, they call it. That phrase is not in here, but I believe that's what that teaches. You you reach that age where what happened to Adam and Eve, go back and look what happened. Their eyes were opened and they knew good and evil. That's what happens. That's the age of accountability. Whatever that is for you, you're doing stuff that you know wrong, but you don't feel condemned over it when you're, you know, eight, nine, something like that. But one day comes when you do those same things and your eyes get open and you see, you see sin for what it is, how it slays that inner man, that inner innocence that you had. And that's how Paul says, I died. And that's why we have to be reborn through the Spirit of God and covered and washed in the blood. Now, here's how sin manifests in us. You know, once that, once that sin revives, here, here's how it gets us. James says it, I think, in 1, 14, he says, Every man, I, I'm just trying to quote it from memory, every man's drawn away and enticed when he's drawn away of his own lusts. And we all have these desires. We all have these lusts. We all have these fleshly things. Big deal. Nothing bad yet. But these lusts, when they conceive, you sit and you've thought about it and you've thought about it and you've thought about it. And now you've got the plan and you, you act on it. It's conceived. And then it says, then that lust is conceived. Then it brings forth sin. And it only in there. Sin, when it has finished, brings forth death. Now, that's the big deal. That's the big kahuna of sin. That's the big cause. That's the big effect of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. He even told Adam back there in the garden, you know, our version of the King James and all these ones we read says, In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. I've seen that Hebrew expounded upon what it actually says. It says, In the day that you eat thereof, to die you shall be dying. I mean, it started right there and it's going to end in death. And it did. It took 930 years for Adam to die, but he died. And, you know, he got to see that for himself and his, and his children. So how do we get rid of this sin? How do we deal with it? Uh, I think it's Hebrews. I got this jotted down. 922, I guess. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And you see that right in the beginning. Adam and Eve, when their eyes were open, they sinned. They saw themselves naked. What did they do? What we all try to do. Cover ourselves in our own strength, our own righteousness. I done told you what that is. It's a filthy rag. It's no good. They tried to sew fig leaves together and cover themselves up, make aprons out of them. <clears throat> and God said he knew that wasn't no good. So it says he took coats of skins. And don't say, you know, it pretty much, pretty much had to be animal skins, did it not? If it was coats of skins. And in which case, that animal had to be slayed and the blood had to be shed. That's what he covered them with. You go on to their first children, Cain and Abel. Cain brought forth the works of his hands, the fruit of the ground. Abel brought forth the firstling of his flock and sacrificed the blood of the lamb. You know, a picture of what was to come. Abel, of course, Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's was rejected. And he slew Abel because of jealousy. And it keeps going on through the Old Testament when he, he brings in the law. He knows they're going to break the law, so he sets up the sacrificial system. Whatever you do, you know, bring the bull, the bullock, the, the lamb, the sheep, all these offerings, shed the blood, and that will cover your sin for the atonement. In the Old Testament, it was all about the atonement, which means a covering. But the blood of bullocks and bulls could never make you perfect. It, it could never remove the sin from your conscious mind. That's why when we turn to the New Testament and we see John the baptizer preaching, you know, I baptize with water, but there's coming one and he stands among you already whose shoes I'm not worthy to loose. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And when he looked up and saw him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. That's the blood. That's Jesus' precious blood that we sing about, that we read about, that we preach about. That's the one. It don't just make an atonement for you. As in a covering, it washes away your sin. Like Isaiah prophesied of it. He said, though your sins be 
uh, like scarlet and uh, like crimson, he said, you're going to be white like wool, white as snow. That's what the blood of Jesus does. And I think that's probably a good place to stop. Just wanted to, you know, tell you why he had to come and die because of our sin. And his blood is the only, you know, what's that old song? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So join us next time. And uh, I don't know what we'll talk about yet, but I promise it'll be out of the Bible. So it'll be good. See you then.